Good evening and welcome to the Silicon Valley Entrepreneur, a series of conversations with startup founders and the investors who fund them. I'm Chris Gill, President and CEO of SVs. It's my pleasure to welcome with us tonight Lola Masterson, uh, founder of Science Futures. And it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for coming along. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate it. I, I really do. Good. So what can you give us a bit of your background? I'd like to dig into you know what we what you're doing with Science Futures, but First of all, tell us a little bit about your background. My background it was as a scientist coming out of college and graduate school. I went into sales and marketing, selling scientific products, which put me right into the mainstream of biotechnology as it was happening with the products that I was selling. The company I was working for, Millipore Corporation, sent me out to California in 1978. And it was like a kid in a candy store because everything was happening out here. And my job was to go around and talk to scientists and see how I could help them uh, develop their products, which were the products were DNA-based uh, codes that were being put into bacteria to make human insulin, human growth factor, TPA, some of the mainstream of biological drugs that we have on the market today. So that's how I started off, and that's how I found biotechnology. And I really started Science Futures in 1983 to support the venture capitalists that I had met that were backing these new companies. And uh, to become an analyst on Wall Street, because I wanted to learn how money made money. And I wanted to, to see it from all sides, the venture side, all the way through to the public offering and post-public offering side. So I started Science Futures as a way to support the industry, to support the people that were creating it, and also to learn the finance part of it. Because there was no place you could go in 1983 to learn venture capital, except to sit at the feet of the venture capitalists that were doing it. And that's what I did, Chris. OK, so uh, this is a, in a very short space of time, you did some huge leaps there. You went from being a scientist to being sales and marketing to being an analyst, to being venture capital. Just slow that down a little bit and tell us a bit more about how those transitions happened. Because you made that sound so easy. Yeah. <laughs> it was easy because it was by design. When I, when I started Science Futures, I thought to myself, uh, I've been a teacher at a college level. I know I can teach. I've been in sales for eight years, and I can teach people to sell, and I can sell. So once I became the product, I realized that I needed something that was as big as the vision that some of these guys had for their companies. And so I took on the biotech industry as my product to sell. Okay. Okay. So I befriended a few uh, people that I had met. And they became my mentors. I had a mentor on Wall Street and a mentor in the venture capital area. And they both took me by the hand and taught me how they did what they did. And I helped them untangle the language, which was not natural to them, but it was natural to me. So I taught them science simply, and they taught me economics 101 simply. OK. And right. it was a good trade-off because <laughs> seven years later, you know, I could start my own fund and, and be investing and actually know what I was doing. Well, we'll come to that in a minute, but e even so, how, how old was the, was the biotech industry when you first engaged with it? It was the, it was the beginning. It was the very, very beginning. It, it, was, it, it, it had no age. It was the birth. Okay. I, I was in on the ground level when... Uh, I, as a uh, salesperson from the Lepore Corporation, was at the NIH in 1976, and one of the scientists said, NOLA, DNA preferentially binds to your filters, and now I can cut and splice it because they just discovered these restriction enzymes, and that makes it a lot easier to work with. And that, that, that basically allowed scientists for the first time to put together in a cut and paste scenario a word that the DNA could unravel inside a bacteria to create a protein drug. So perhaps we should explain to people what does what is what does biotech actually mean? Because we're glibly using this uh, word. Good question, and it's and it's evolved over the time that I've known it. But it, biotechnology was really the, the the study of life sciences, the biology. Uh, or the technology of using biology to study life sciences. And in a very real sense, it became the foundation for drug discovery and drug development. And so people use it in a lot to, to talk about the drug industry these days. Because it, the biologically based drugs have taken over 
uh, predominantly from the chemical-based drug industry, mm -hmm. which is what I was born into in the, the 50s and the 60s. Okay, so now, uh, now I've got a better handle on it as well, too, good, because good. that's not my, my area of expertise, right. and that was very helpful. Now, prior to, I mean, just explain, at, 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 at some points along the way, you've been involved with a number of startups yes. that you were involved in as a founder. Right. Can you tell us a little bit about how those came about and where they fit into this, this, this history that you have? Yeah, well, the earliest startup was really at Kleiner Perkins, uh, a company called IDEC Pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. And uh, m my mentor, Brooke Byers, had done two deals with his, uh, his guru down in San Diego. Hang on, hang on, let me just stop you there. You've just glibly gone past that you had Brooke Byers from Kleiner Perkins, Corfield and Byers, as, as your mentor. How did that happen? I mean, there are people who would kill to get that. I was, I, I was fortunate. Brooke and I met when I was in sales, uh, and he was at Hypertech. Uh, he had he'd started Hypertech mm -hmm. when Bob Swanson started uh, Genentech, and we were, we were peers. We were, we were about the same age. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and he, he liked how I was handling my sales team, because I, you know, did handed over whatever he wanted over to my the guy that was working for me at the time and said Roger this is your 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 company Hypertech and then uh, we realized we lived in the same town we lived a couple of blocks from each other so we had coffee one day we realized we had this passion for biotech he had a house in Lake Tahoe I had a house in Lake Tahoe we met a couple of times up there to talk about the biotech industry and as I evolved my idea for science futures I took it to him first mm -hmm. and he suggested I go down to Hypertech and talk to Ted Green and 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 see it, it, how how it was going to evolve because I actually didn't know what Science Futures was going to be. I didn't know it was going to be a helping the venture capital mm -hmm. industry. I, I I just got the name and I liked it and it right. made it made some sense to me that I would I would evolve out of just being in some other corporation and take on this larger role. And so um, Brooke hired me as a consultant to look at deals. Mm -hmm. And as he would hire me to look at deals, I would take notes on how he was talking to the people that he was talking to, and how and and his his relationship with Ivor Royston led to a second deal called Genprobe, and when he did that deal, I was an analyst on Wall Street by that time right. under the guise of Science Futures, and I was able to take uh, Genprobe public through Merrill Lynch, so you know th th we were helping each other. Okay, again, this is some major leaps of things you've done here, so. You, you, you buy a, a series of, of, of fortunate circumstances, got to meet with Brooke, and it developed from there because he, he was impressed with you. You then got to be an analyst on Wall Street. How did that come about? Same way. I was telling a friend I wanted to support the biotech industry, and he said, you should meet my friend Richard Vitor. He's at Drexel Burnham. He's the pharmaceutical analyst. And as a smart pharmaceutical analyst, at, when, he, when we met in California, he was from New York, he had a sixth sense the biotech was going to become an important part of pharmaceuticals, but he didn't know how. So he contracted with me to write some primers for Wall Street, and he actually taught me how to write for Wall Street. The first primer was, what is a DNA, DNA probe, mm -hmm. and why is it important? The second primer is, what is an amino acid, and what, what does that have to do with pharmaceuticals? The third primer was, what does the separations industry have to do with the biotech industry, and where's the play? And then the fourth one, finally, they let me do a buy recommendation. <laughs> and I said, well, here's the layup. Now that I've got a feel for you guys, how about Applied Biosystems? It's a tool company. You don't have to buy Genentech if you're not sure because it doesn't have any products and it's just a bunch of scientists thinking that they can make something. Here, here's something with products that's selling picks and shovels to the gold miners. Mm -hmm. And that was, it was a great buy recommendation in 1984. Okay. So th these things were very synergistic, watching what, what Brooke was doing at Kleiner, watching what Wall Street was taking public, watching the post-public financings and being able to be called in as a expert witness mm -hmm. to explain the science to these mm -hmm. people was my job in the early 80s. Okay. And it was also my job to cook up IDEC because it was the third Ivor Royston deal and Brooke said, my partners will kill me if I come in with Ivor's third deal. You do it, Nola. And I would, was just like you, with a glint in my right. eye. And I got on a plane, and I went to San Diego, and I spent two weeks with Ivor and his first employee, Bob Sobel, and, and a guy named Maurizio Zanetti, who had written a primer on what is an anti-idiotype monoclonal antibody. 
and uh, we, 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 we cook that deal up by finding all the scientists in the world that are working in that area of science. Two of them happen to be right here in Stanford, and mm -hmm. they had already published in Blood Magazine, and they had treated nine patients. And I went in to meet them, and I said to them, you know, cooking up a deal, and who's backing you guys? And it was a little company called Damon Biologics, which does, isn't around anymore. And I said, well, I'm working with Kleiner. And they were like, well, we, we should have probably taken Kleiner money now that we <laughs> think about it. But, you know, it turned out that they, uh, one of the guys, Ron Levy, had double dated with Ivor Royston in graduate school. Mm -hmm. So we, I said to Brooke, we've got to put these together. We can't have any outliers. Everybody in this space should be in, on the same team. And it took about 18 months and a lot of legal paperwork to get that together, but IDEC was born out of that. Okay. And I was able to sell the idea to the Kleiner Perkins board, which included Floyd Kwame and a lot of software giants mm -hmm, at the time, mm -hmm, by telling mm -hmm. them this was not going to be easy and it would probably take about 15 years before we saw a product. But in 1984, that didn't seem like such didn't a long a time. Yeah, yeah. And that was absolutely the truth. And it was 15 years later mm. that Rituxan found its way to the market. So, so what, what was, was this one of the companies? So did, did, would you say you, in, you f founded the company or you invested in it? Or well, I, I wrote the first business plan. I sold okay. it to the board of Kleiner Perkins. Yeah. Uh, I then went back to Brooke to tell him about the deal that we had, we had talked about casually, which is I would come in at the same price the Kleiner put in. Right. And I would give him back and the consulting money he'd given me as my investment in IDEC. Right. Which is how I became an investor. Got it. Okay. Because it was the only way I could, I didn't have a fund, but I would re be willing if I got to cook up a deal and I believed in it to take my consulting money and put it back on the table. Okay. And it was interesting though, Chris, because the next round, IDEC went to $7 from $1 and I sold my share. Oh, you were able to do that at that time? Um, nobody told me I couldn't. Okay. And I didn't know enough to ask permission, so I asked you forgiveness <laughs> after it was over. Right. And it was just a matter of Christmas presents needed to be bought for my child at that time, and mm -hmm. it wasn't that much. There, there wasn't. We're not talking about that many shares. Right. So it was my way of, of making ice cubes, you know. Mm -hmm. When you needed them, you used them, and then you went into the next deal. And okay. that's how I learned how to be an investor. Okay, but what about the companies you actually founded? You were C CEO of some of the companies. Yes, yeah, Sequinom was a company I founded in 1993 with a German venture uh, capitalist, Helmut Schussler, and a German venture uh, genius uh, named Hubert Koster. And the idea for that company was to get the mass weight of DNA. There's a theme running here uh, about DNA yep. in my life. Yep. And in 1993, nobody knew how to get the mass weight of A, T, G, and C. Mm -hmm. It was a mystery. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Dr. Costa said, I think we can use uh, uh, mass spectrometry. There's a new type called uh, mass-assisted laser absorption ionization, MALDI-TOF, time of flight, mass spec. And I think DNA can fly in that. We can find out what it was. The computer will give it back if we, if we put it in small enough SNPs. And that's still the gold standard today is, is what Sequinome has as an instrument. Uh, wh why is that an important thing to be able to measure? Uh, because we had a map. We wanted to make the human genome map. Right. And unless you knew exactly what you had, and whether it was an A, a T, a G, or a C, there were lots of mistakes being made with the existing technology at the time, which was electrophoresis. It was inac inaccurate. Okay. It was, it, so we, we, we took a physics tool and applied it in biology. Mm, mm. And it worked very well to give us accurate information. And of course, that's been superseded um, by faster, better, cheaper things today. Mm -hmm. But it allows you to get your own DNA tested and have it be fairly accurate. Uh, and that's just DNA. I mean, that w w we really broke through a scientific barrier at that time. Sequinome went public the same year the DNA uh, genomic code was released uh, mm -hmm. on the front page of Science Magazine. Yep. So it hit the public market at, at a high in 2000. It priced it at 26 and opened at 79 on February 1st, 2000. Wow. And I got a call from book buyers that day saying, congratulations. I'm sure you did, yeah. And I felt, uh, I felt like I had my Genentech story now, yeah. you know, because I had done that. And I did go in as CEO, and I did, and I did pull the whole team together on the, on the scientific advisory board and stayed on that board f until 1998. So tell us about how, this is, was this your first startup that you've been the CEO of? 
Yes, it was. So how did you pull together the, the team? Obviously, you'd been an investor prior to that, you'd been an analyst, so you'd seen a lot of companies. Yep. Nevertheless, doing it the first time is different from watching it. Yes. So how did you pull together the team and make it start happening? First thing we did was pull together somebody that had patents around DNA. That was Charles Cantor. Uh, he was a fairly well-known guy in the DNA f field. And the, th this, the th this third person in the team, to Ho Hubert's idea, was a guy that knew how to build mass spectrometers. But and he was at Johns Hopkins. So I went around and met these guys, yep. talked them into joining Sequinome, talked them into leaving academia. Charles left academia. It's the first right. time he ever had left academia to come on board. But before they left academia, we put scientists in their labs and had them work in their labs at Boston University and Johns Hopkins. So, it, because that was, we, we were shoestring. It was 1994. Mm -hmm. Venture capital was tough at this time. Uh, I, I used the Klein and Perkins model and took $200,000 and said, let me finish polishing the business plan and get some science off the ground. I took, uh, I took my venture capital investment of $200,000 and I leveraged that to get a, a half a million dollar lease line mm -hmm. so that we could buy some mass spectrometry equipment and put it into the laboratories both in Hamburg and Boston University so we could start to get the if out of the science because there was a lot of if at that time. If you could make DNA fly in a mass spec, then you could get the mass weight. But there was we, we had to get the if out. Nobody nobody knew if you would get that if out. That these are the challenges in the early days of making tools for biotechnology. This is quite an amazing story that you're able to go to people who didn't previously know you. They may have known of you, but didn't previously know you and convince them to leave their... I was in sales. <laughs> <laughs> See, I started my life in sales. So when I would get on to an idea, it was very easy for me to, to convince people that this was the train that was going to leave the station and was going to and was going to go to the end goal, which was really at that time to, to, to get a scientific uh, map made about DNA. And you needed this. You needed this tool. And it didn't exist in many of the same ways that people think it's very easy to think of an app for an iPhone now. Yep. But what about the iPhone? I mean, that was a pretty big leap. Sure. So, you yep. know, th we were doing that same kind of leap, but scientists are attracted to, to it, wasn't, it wasn't that hard, actually. As I look back on it, they, they enjoyed those early days. Okay. All they right. And, and there was a second one after that, wasn't there, that you, you were involved with? As a, as there had been a couple of them. A couple of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you yeah. want to tell us a bit about those? Were they in the same sort well, of Well, what, what, what happened after Sequinum went public is I joined TVM uh, Venture Capital, which was a um, venture firm that backed Sequinum in right. all five years. And I opened up the San Francisco office. And from there, I went on to invest in NanoStream, uh, which, which did not go anywhere, but it was my investment early, and then I, I, I continued to continue it with TVM's money, and that was out of Pasadena. That was, a, that was another scientific tool. Uh, one that is working for me now, right now, is Wafergen, uh, which, is, which is PCR, uh, polymerase chain reaction, which is a, a technical term for doing DNA again. Okay. So, you can, so uh, I've stayed yeah. right within my own level of comfort by in investing in tools. And, mm -hmm. and what I sold early in, in my career were tools. So the tool industry is, is, is ever evolving. Okay. My mm -hmm. father was a surgeon, and surgeons like to create surgical instruments. Mm -hmm. So that was an easy play for me in the early days to look at surgical instruments and CAT scans and diagnostic instruments and say, these are important to doctors. These are the tools that will be important to scientists. And with, with the companies that you've founded and the companies you've invested in, what has been the most important factors? Has it been the science? Has it been the people? Has it been the money? What? It's always the people. Okay. It's always the people. And Brooke gave me the, the gems that I, I needed, the, the real pearls of wisdom, which was invest in an idea that's genius with a genius person who's coachable. They don't always come And they don't always coach. No, they're not. Yeah. They don't always come together. But there's lots of good ideas. But genius is really where you make the big leaps. And there aren't always genius ideas. And many geniuses are not coachable. How do you recognize a genius idea? Because there are many ideas that are way off the wall over there somewhere. 
that the person who could dream up the mites are genius. How do you recognize a genius? Well, that's, uh, that's a great question. Usually, it comes from a genius mind that has created genius ideas before it. Mm -hmm. So you know a wave by the wave that came before it, and the wave that came before it, and the wave that came before it. So serial entrepreneurs very often are extremely backable for that reason. Mm -hmm. Because they, they understood and they were always ahead of their time. I always looked, as the name of my firm implied, Science Futures, 15 years out to find something that if we financed it, in five to seven years would be the genius idea. So tell us a bit more about that. Tell us a bit more about what's interesting you now. What are you looking for for that, for that 15 years out from, from now, and, and why? Well, I, I, you know, you may, it's it, 15 years out now for me is, 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 is very much into my, will be my older age. So I'm letting, I'm letting the, the history lessons inform me. Mm -hmm. And I, I, if I go back to my history, I'm the edge of the baby boomers where they needed to build schools when we were going to high school because they'd never seen so many children need to go to school. Now we're going to have a senior population that's going to have normal aging problems that have never been seen before but could have some solutions. Yes. One of the ideas I recently saw that I loved, Chris, is called an ear pod. Okay, tell me more. Uh, if you can. I, I can. I yeah. can because this is this is this is a is it's it's actually a deal that's, that that I, I looked at and, and I'm very intrigued with. And it, it in 1985, I helped Rodney Perkins start Resound, which was an in-the-ear programmable hearing aid. Mm -hmm. So I, I had a, a clue as to what, what ear surgeons could do to make, you know, the aesthetics of ear, ear uh, devices better because people didn't want them showing. Hmm. But now we have a culture that's very proud to have things coming out of their ears. Yes. Very proud. Yes. And this ear pod is an ex it's, it's an extenuation of that, that you don't have to have miniaturize to the point where you are losing a definition of sound. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is have earplugs that come into something that could be under your jacket mm -hmm. or, or be like this microphone, but that actually can pick up sound and that can be programmable, whether you want to hear the lecturer in the front of the, or the movie yep. or you're in a, in a crowded room with cocktail party and you want to tone down back. You know, these, the programmable part is there. What we weren't used to have seeing is seeing what it was. And we, you don't have to have it over the ear. You can just have it as a little mini iPod. Right. And very good. Very interesting yeah. because it's not about losing your hearing. It's losing it gradually. Mm. Mm. And so this is something, just like you and I wear glasses. Mm. I didn't wear these 15 years ago. Yeah. So 15 years from now, I may need an ear pod. Yeah. But as you said, it's an accepted thing now because you see the people walking around with it, yeah. and it's, it's totally yeah. accepted. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, so, so it, so it's, it's a kind of a sociology, psychology, and basic needs, basic needs. I mean, people needed basic tools to study science. People need basic tools to run their life: hearing, seeing, hmm. walking. You know, my father was an orthopedic surgeon, so I've always liked orthopedics. Right. And there's all kinds of new gadgets for knees and hips and backs and that kind of thing, so that you know we. we we can have, you know, body parts chain interchangeable now, and that wasn't something that I grew up with or mm, you sure, grew up with. Sure. So you know, the the world evolves, and and the entrepreneur spirit evolves with it. And all you have to do is where is the unmet need, and where is the genius idea that will fill that? And genius ideas usually are so simple, you think, why didn't I think of that? That's usually the hallmark of a genius idea. I was going to ask you about that. Was it was it the the, the really detailed science is in the DNA work, or was it stuff more like, as you say, there's an application there with the earpod, and and the the average layman could come up with that. Actually, making it happen would take a lot more than the average layman. Right. But wh where do you, does your stuff come from deep science, or does it come from, as you say, meeting that need? Somebody saying, hey, you know, there's a real need over there. Oh, it's a mixture. It's a mixture of both. In the early days of biotech, uh, just being able to clone alpha interferon, beta interferon was a miracle. Mm. Then finding a use for them, finding where 
the, the interferon could be utilized and, and targeted in m multiple sclerosis. That was another 15 mm -hmm. years, mm -hmm. you know. So, so the, the miracle of finding that we could make what the body was already making outside the body and then give it back to the body, but the fine tuning was in what disease and in what concentration and what are the side effects and who metabolizes what where. So today I sit on two uh, publicly traded boards of directors that are developing drugs because TVM, the, the, the firm I joined in 2000, invested in a lot of drug companies. So I have a lot of, of, of experience and knowledge to know that the, the, the drugs evolve slowly over mm -hmm. time. And time is always, you know, the killer of money. Because when you put your yeah. money to work, you really want to get it returned faster. Oh. And I, I must say that this has been, if I was honest, this is the, the least likely feel to ever give your money your money back fast. Mm. So the time to, to return on capital and biotech is, is not faster because right. of the skills of the scientists or the different way of science. It's just as slow and agonizingly painful as it ever was. Okay. Time is also being a, a, a problem for us now. We're, we're running out of time. Do you have any final words of encouragement for entrepreneurs watching the show? Keep your business plan smart, which means sensible, measurable, achievable, uh, and, and re revenue producing in a short period of time, as short as you possibly can. Okay. Smart. All right, Nola, thank you very much indeed for your time. This has been absolutely okay. fascinating. Time has gone by far too fast, but there's lots more I'd like to talk about, but unfortunately we are now done. So um, thank you very much, Nola. Pleasure to have you here, and it's a good night from me, Chris Gill, and I hope to see you again next month. So.